so uh, last time we talked about edge detection, right? So purely the question of how do we find uh, pixels in the image that correspond to edges? And those could have been like, you know, we could have designed general edge detectors like the Laplacian that respond to whatever edges there are in the image, or we could have used detectors like Sobel detectors, which are sensitive to either horizontal or vertical edges. We could even use bigger edge masks to help us detect edges in diagonal directions, for example. Um, but what I want to talk about today is a little bit more like how do we put these edges that we've detected together into more useful constructs, right? So at the very end of the last lecture, we talked about the canny edge detector, which had this nice property that it seemed to do a pretty good job of outlining you know, objects if we tuned those high and low thresholds correctly, right? So kind of one question is how do we use those you know, closed curves that we can see in the image? How do we describe those mathematically? So that's kind of the first part. And the second part is Sometimes we want to do something very specific. For example, you know, suppose I want to detect you know, doorways and windows in an environment. One, opportun or one uh, idea would be to search for long straight lines. Those are the kinds of things that make up man-made objects in the world. And so we want to talk specifically about how do we take this mess of edge pixels and decide which ones may lie on uh, straight lines in the world. Let's see, I'm kind of down one projector here. I don't know why that is. Figure it out. Okay. I don't know what's wrong with that. So, first kind of um, thing I talk about is edge linking. Because I'm obsessive compulsive guides. So try to see how it's here. I'll see you too, Mark. Figure it out. I'll see you too. Okay, so the idea is that we've got a edge map, and um, let's say we start with edge pixels and corresponding maps for the magnitude of the edge response and the angle of the edge response, right? And so one idea that we could have is why don't we try to connect up edges that have similar orientations, right? And I only want to do that for edges that have sufficiently large magnitudes. And so the idea is for each pixel, for each edge pixel x, y. So now from now on, we're only going to consider kind of a binary map of pixels that made it into the edge map, right? So things that have passed our Sobel detectors or our Laplacian and now we basically have just either uh, pixels at an edge or a pixels not at an edge, okay? But those edge maps are still typically pretty noisy. So the idea is for every edge pixel, we uh, make a window. So let's call that SXY around that pixel. Right, so kind of the zoom in is that here's my image, you know, here is my edge pixel, and maybe here is my window. And then what I do is to say, okay, for each other pixel inside that window, um, link the center pixel to that pixel if, for example, the magnitude of the edge is similar, so that's less than some threshold, and the angle of that edge is similar. Right, so the idea is to say, okay, you know, say that this estimated, estimated angle is that the edge is in this direction, okay? And so that may correspond to some sort of a actual edge passing through the image, so maybe what I say is, okay, you know, I don't care about what's going on at my neighbor over here. Um, I want to look in the direction of where my edge is pointing. I want to have similar orientations, and I only want to connect up local edges if the magnitudes are similar, right? 
So I don't want to connect up weak edges that happen to have the same angle. I only want to do that for kind of strong magnitude edges. And that way, you can do things like maybe you can bridge gaps that you missed before. You can kind of build edges into long strings of pixels. Okay. So this can be used to kind of um, trace out <coughs> long edges. Because what you're doing is you're just kind of following your nose along the edge direction, and you stop doing that when the magnitudes are not sufficiently large, right? So that's one way to kind of make, you know, long strings of edges. Um, once you've got these long strings of edges, the next thing you want to do is kind of try to describe those, right? And so remember last time we had this issue where we had basically like the window of a building or a door that was pretty well outlined. And so the next step I want to think about is how do we follow that boundary around and describe that boundary and then we can say, okay, now I've got this window that is encoded by this list of ordered pixels around the edge. So I would say the next step is kind of boundary following. And so this is like saying, you know, we have edge points around a closed contour. Or I guess it could be an open contour, but let's talk about closed contour. And we want to, you know, kind of link or order them. And let's say in a clockwise direction. And so what I'm going to tell you now is an algorithm called uh, Moore's Boundary Following Algorithm. Okay. And what that's going to do is it's going to take a set of edge pixels. And so I've already prepared a uh, little map of edges. Right. So suppose that this is the um, you know, set of edges that I've gotten around some closed contour. And I want to assign a natural order to these guys right? in such a way that then maybe I can compare the orders that correspond to different objects and do things like object matching. Right? So say this is the thing that describes my object. I want to find similar things on the conveyor belt by matching up the boundaries. Right? So let me describe to you the algorithm first, and then we're going to apply it to this little blobby image. So I'm going to write down the algorithm on paper first, and then we'll come back to actually doing it. So the algorithm is as follows. So first we have to decide on a place to start. So we're going to let the starting point, which we're going to call B0, be the um, uppermost leftmost point labeled 1. And so by, by label 1, I mean kind of the initial position is that we have an edge map. You know, 1 equals edge pixel, 0 equals not. Okay, so we start with a binary image. I'm going to find myself the first point Basically, I'm saying I'm going to take the point in the top row that is to the leftmost, right? So here's my top row. This guy would be my B0, okay? And then I'm going to let C0 be the left neighbor of B0, okay? And so here in my map here, C0 is going to be this guy. And I know that this can't be an edge point because by definition, I said that B0 was the leftmost edge point in the top row, right? So this couldn't possibly be an edge point, okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start looking around my neighbors starting from C0. I'm going to look clockwise for the next edge point, okay? So the next step is um, examine the eight neighbors of B0, starting at C0, and going clockwise. 
and I'm going to let B1 be the first edge point that I find. And C1 be the preceding 0. Right? So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, um, actually what I should do is put this up like this. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to start with this guy. I'm going to kind of start searching my way around. And the first new guy I'm going to find is here. right? So kind of I started here. I went all the way around. And I found this was my next edge point. And then I'm going to let C1 be the preceding blank space. right? Again, that can't be an edge because I found the first edge. right? And then the idea is that now I basically start over again with this B and this C. So kind of I'm going to say, you know, I let you know, B equals B1 and C equals C1. And then I keep on repeating this process of updating uh, B and C. So let me go around for a while. So OK. I'm going to say, now I'm going to start here. I'm going to go clockwise from this point until I get to my next point here. This is C2. Then I'm going to go like this. This is my B3. This is my C3. Now I have to go all the way around here to find B4. This is my C4. And so on. Right? So I'm just going to go kind of follow my guy around here. Pretty mechanical. So you might think that there's nothing really uh, hard about this algorithm, and you would be right. Uh, the only thing you have to kind of think about is what happens around these folds here. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. So I'm following, following, following. Following clockwise to this. Here, I'm going to follow clockwise to here. Oops, B13, C13. OK, and then I'm almost about to stop, right? So when do I stop? Let me just say my stopping criterion over here. I'm going to stop, or I'm going to continue, until I arrive back at my starting point and the next boundary point found is B1. In this case, we don't really have this problem because if I start here at um, what I do here, C12, I follow this around B13. Did I, did I label this right? I think this is yeah, that's C13. this is C13. Okay. Right. I think that's C12, that's C13. Right. It's C12 that's C13. Okay. Then I follow this around and I arrive back here, and this is my kind of B. You know, this would be what I would call B14, but then as I find this around, I find that I would have gotten back to the same point. It may not seem like I need to have this little caveat, but the reason that I need it is in cases where you know this B0 is kind of tucked in a weird way around the edge. It's kind of hard to explain what the corner case is, but suffice it to say that you need it. right? So basically, I just keep on following the edges around. Now you can see I've got this kind of nicely ordered list of edges. And then that's it. So um, basically, the um, ordered list of Bs is the boundary. Right? And so this basically um, lets me describe the boundary. And now I think about how do I actually take that information and keep it in some sort of concise way. One thing that I could do is um, I could use what's called a chain code to represent the order of the boundary pixels. So once we have such a boundary, we can describe it with, for example, what's called a chain code. And the idea is that what I do is I define a three-bit direction corresponding to 
the direction of my next boundary point. And for convenience, I'm going to start at 0 over here. And so what I could say in this case is, OK, I've got my uh, boundary. I don't know if I can put all this stuff on the same thing. But I can basically say, what direction does my edge point to in each, in each case? right? So in this case, you know, going from B0 to B1, I go in the 0 direction. To go from B1 to B2, I again go in the 0 direction. And let's see if I can kind of get this all in one screen. To go from B2 to B3, I go in the 0 direction. To go from here to here, I would go in the southwest direction, which turns out to be 5. Here I would go south, which is 6. South again, south again, so I have 6, 6. Then I go uh, east, or I'm sorry, west for 3 steps, so that's 4, 4, 4. Then I go north for 1 step, which is 2. I go northwest, no, northeast, I don't know. I'd be lost in the forest, apparently, if I had to do this. Then I go this way, then I go that way, and then I'm done, right? So this is like a very concise way of describing things. And of course, this order kind of depends on the starting point, right? So the order depends on the starting point, which, you know, by convention, we said was the upper left-hand point. But, um, you know, suppose that we wanted to uh, compare two shapes one that was like this and one that was like this on its side, right? Those are fundamentally the same shape. If I started to describe them with the chain code, I would get two different chain codes. One reason is that, you know, the upper left-hand point would be different, and the other reason would be that the order of directions is going to be like 90 degrees reversed from this guy, right? And so we can solve that with two issues. One is that, for example, we could... Um, you know, so to be able to match shapes at different orientations, um, we can, one, um, for example, order the chain code so it always starts with the minimum magnitude integer. By that I mean, you know, here, if I look at the possibilities, Right? Here I already have started with 0. That would be good. But the other thing would be if I had a chain code where 0 was somewhere in the middle, I could just cyclically shift this whole thing because you know this thing kind of defines the same shape no matter where I start in the sequence. And so what I can do is just shift this around until I start with the lowest number I have. Right? So that's one way to kind of make things you know, invariant. And the other thing that I can do is um, just encode the difference between directions. Right? And what I mean by that is that here, this chain code is kind of giving me an absolute direction, right? Go east, go east, go north, right? The other thing that I could do is basically say, Actually, instead, I'm just going to tell you how many clicks around the eight-sided clock you have to go to get to the next edge pixel, right? So, for example, I could turn this guy here into a difference one, where I say, okay, there's no difference between me and this guy. So I'd say that's difference of zero. There's no difference between me and this guy. That's difference of zero. There's a difference of five clicks between this, me and this guy. So that's five. There's a difference of one click here. Then I go in the same direction, the same direction. The difference between four and six is like going uh, like six clicks in the wrong direction. Right? So we're talking about mod eight arithmetic. That's like saying to get from four to six, I have to go um, six around, right? So to get from zero to five, I had to go one, two, three, four, five. Get, did I do this the wrong way? Let's see. 
Yeah, I guess that here I'm kind of going counterclockwise, right? So I'm saying that here the difference is five to zero. So I'm kind of talking about how many clicks counterclockwise I have to do. So to get from four to six, I have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Okay, so then I go that, then I have two, again, not do anything. Then I have a, to get from four to two, I have to go, again, that's like a six guy. Then I have a seven, then I have a two, then I have another seven. Uh, no, six. six. And then to get back to the starting point, I have a seven. Right? So these are like the differences. And the advantage of this is that then, even if I had this shape and it was rotated by like 45 degrees, my chain code with the differences would still be the same chain code no matter which way I turned this as long as I was in a 45 degree clip, right? So that would be like a very nice and variant way of describing this shape, okay? And so one of the homework assignments is basically to code up this little algorithm. And so I can show you my implementation of it. So let's see here. Uh, I guess I need to get to my desktop. I need to start that lab. Sorry about this. Yeah, so of course MATLAB has some built-in stuff for you to do this, but I would like to see you try and do it yourself. Um, let's see what we're doing here. Okay, so here I have a little shape that I made. And actually I think this is maybe the same shape that's on my homework. So, oops. Again, this could be the result of doing edge detection and a little, a little tiny guy. Um, let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Right, so here's my binary edge map, right? And so what I want to do is just follow that around. And I just wrote a little function to do that that I called edge link. Hey, I want you to move over here and stay there. Okay. And hopefully it will work. So kind of here what you see, I'm sorry this is so small, is that I'm basically just, the red point is my current edge point, the blue point is my previous edge point, and you know, it just traces around. You can see, it kind of went by fast, I can kind of show you again, that um, there's one little uh, blip on this guy where there's actually kind of an interior edge point, and we shouldn't count that on our list of edges, right? So one nice thing about this boundary tracing algorithm is it ignores any edge pixels or white pixels that are fully inside the shape. So I don't want to really count this guy. And you'll notice that as it goes around, it doesn't actually count that interior point. And I don't know if I can make this bigger or if it will complain. All right, so you can see it kind of just ignored that little point in the middle there. And as it's going around, it's checking different things. This is so that when it says checking, it's just like investigating all the neighbors starting from the previous thing. And it's also keeping track of what direction did I have to go to find out where I was. And at the end of the day, when it gets back up to the upper left-hand corner, it will spit out for me basically a list of pixels. And if I had been smart enough to ask, I would have also gotten the chain code. Um, so I guess I can just show you, well, So this is what I'm going to ask you to code up yourself. I guess we have to watch it play again. Um, and of course, while we're doing this, I guess maybe I can't do this while MATLAB is uh, moving. There's also a MATLAB command called uh, BW trace boundary, which I probably shouldn't tell you about, but I'll tell you about it anyway. So this is kind of like the MATLAB function that will give you some boundary pixels. Now, you know, just I'm not sure that MATLAB's function corresponds exactly to the algorithm I just told you. I mean, I think it's probably pretty similar, but you know, you can try your try to check your work against this, but I'm not entirely sure that it gives you exactly the same output in the way I just defined it. FYI, and let's just see where we got. And so yeah, here you can see that the second output that I asked for was this chain code. So here I find out that I have 81 pixels. And this tells me the direction I had to go to get to each pixel, right? I didn't do the differential chain coding thing here, but it would be pretty easy to do uh, to convert that. Okay. Question. When we're doing the mod eight, uh, minus eight arithmetic, um, 
how will we know that we got the right answer and not the reverse? When you're doing the modding, how do you know the mar whether you got the right answer? When you went from four to two, it was six. Well, what happens if we said that was two, and how would we know that was wrong? Right. So here, basically, to be really clear, I'm taking, you know, this guy minus this guy mod eight, right? So it's kind of like saying I take bi plus one minus bi mod eight, right? And so when I have a positive difference, then I should have a, you know, number basically less than four, right? So six minus five is one. Here, when I look at four minus six mod eight, I have minus two mod eight, which is equal to six, right? So I think that's a sanity check is if I'm, you know, if, if I'm greater than my previous neighbor, I should be kind of in the zero to four clicks this way. If I'm less than my previous neighbor, I'm going to have between, you know, five, six, seven, or I guess four, five, six, seven, right? So yeah, you have to keep track of, you know, what you're, and of course, this would be very easy to do in MATLAB, right? If I looked at my output, uh, which is somewhere. Right, so if I looked at my output, I could do something like just look at the, um, let's just say I just look at the first um, 20 of these guys. So I could just say, for example, uh, tell me what this from the second to the end minus these guys, and then I could just look at this whole thing, mod eight. Right? So I, that would give me all I would need, right? So there's no need to actually manually worry about it. Okay, so other questions or comments about this kind of edge linking algorithm? Okay, so this is all still pretty kind of crude, like pixel level. And so what I, what I want to focus on for the rest of the time is a little bit more like ge geometry level description of what might be going on, right? So a natural thing that I might want to do is to take a set of pixels and turn them into edges, right? So if I look back at my uh, shape here, one thing I might want to try to do is to describe the shape as a polygon. Right? So I want to, for example, turn this into something where the top is a straight line, and this is a diagonal, and this is another straight line, this is a straight line. Right? So how would I kind of find the best polygon that would succinctly describe the shape? Right? Obviously, I could use the pixels themselves as a very kind of fine detail shape, but I mean, that would be kind of overkill, right? In the sense that, you know, here, I don't want to have to kind of approximate this thing by a series of tiny polygonal segments, I want to take this whole swath of points and describe it by a nice straight line that roughly passes through the points, right? So basically, you can imagine that I could devise a polygon fitting algorithm that would have as one of its parameters the tolerance for how carefully I wanted to fit through the edge points. And as long as my tolerance was not basically, you know, zero tolerance for error, then I could get away with describing this thing as a nice polygon. So let me tell you about one such algorithm for um, polygonal fitting. So polygonal fitting to a set of ordered points. Right, so kind of, you know, we imagine that we have kind of, a, as a prerequisite, I've already followed my edges around to create an ordered list, right? So that was kind of this boundary following algorithm is a prerequisite for the algorithm I'm going to tell you about next. And so the idea is something like this. You know, suppose that I have some, you know, set of edge points, which I'm just using as circles, that don't lie exactly on straight lines. Kind of what I want to be able to do is to turn this into a reasonable polygon. And I'll consider that to be a success as long as none of these points is kind of sufficiently far away from one of the lines, right? I mean, as I was saying earlier, it would be overkill to connect the dots, right? Connecting the dots would, yes, give me a polygon, but it wouldn't be a very useful one because it would be just so fine detail and noisy, right? Again, this is a good thing to do, for example, if I want to try to find, you know, 
roughly fine rectangles in an image or roughly fine triangles in an image, I maybe want to connect up these points, right? So now I'm going to tell you about um, an algorithm that does that, okay? And the rough idea is pretty simple. So um, I'm going to give you a rough, rough idea first, then we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. So um, let's let uh, P be a sequence of ordered distinct points, meaning no repeats, right? And so, for example, this in our case corresponds to um, ordered edges after a boundary falling. Okay, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, specify uh, two kind of starting points A and B. Okay, and this pair of points is slightly different depending on whether the curve that I want to fit is like a closed curve, like going around the window, or whether it's a straight line, or not a straight line, whether it's a open-ended curve, like maybe following the boundary of an archway or something like that. So I don't have to necessarily have a closed curve, but um, if the curve is open, then basically A and B are the natural endpoints. If the curve is closed, I would choose, for example, A and B to be the left and rightmost points. Okay, and then I also have to specify a threshold, which I'm going to say is T. And T basically says, you know, that's how close every point is ultimately going to have to be to one of these boundary lines, okay? And now what I'm going to do is kind of like this, oh, question. What type of T, are we talking pixel distance, or are we talking nominal yes. distance? Yes, so this is going to be like pixel distance. So the T is going to be measured in pixels. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make two stacks of points that are kind of going to tell me the order I'm processing these vertices in, okay? So basically, um, I'm going to create two stacks. So this is kind of a computer science-y kind of way of thinking about this. Um, one I'm going to call final, and one I'm going to call in process. And I'm going to initialize the final one as being one of the endpoints. And the in-process one is going to be BA. And I'm going to assume that I'm using a closed curve, just for this example. If it's open curve, you would use just A. And now what I'm going to do is um, execute the following steps. And so I'm going to write this down kind of mechanically on a piece of paper first, and I'm going to show you an example with a pair of, with, with some actual points. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to connect, uh, or I'm going to compute the line connecting the last vertices of final and in process. Okay, and I guess I can actually just jump to a picture here. So here's a picture of a set of points where I want to fit a polygon to. Okay, and so I've done what I said. I have initialized A and B as being the left and rightmost points in this collection of edge points. Okay, so the first step that I just said was compute a line that connects the last vertices of the two stacks. And so 
the two stacks are B and BA, so I want to make a line between B and A. Okay, that's pretty easy to do. So here's my line. Okay. Now I'm going to compute the distances from this line to all the points between these vertices. Okay. So I'm going to compute the distances from this line to all points between these vertices. And so here, between is going to be in the um, in the sense of um, kind of going between them in a let's see so if I said B to A in a counterclockwise direction okay and I'm going to select the vertex or the point V max with the maximum distance D max. Okay, so let's look at my picture. So here, if I'm going from B to A and I'm asking, okay, well, what is the vertex that has the longest distance? In this case, I'm just looking at straight line distances like this. And so clearly, this guy here is furthest away from the line, right? So this is going to be my maximum vertex. And so let me make that, you know, I'm going to give that guy a new name, C. Okay, this is the worst guy. Very bad. And so now I'm going to say, if this distance is bigger than the threshold that I set, then I'm going to put this new vertex that I named at the end of in process and um, go to step one. Okay. So now what I do is I say, okay, let's keep track of what my stacks are. So here I'm going to make uh, final on this side and in process on this side. Right. So I started with the stacks being B and BA. Right. I found these points. I found this was my worst offender. And then I said, okay, well, in this case, I need to add a new point to the end of in process. Okay, and I go to step one. Okay. All right, now I go back to step one. I say, now I have to connect these two vertices, right? And what is my worst offender, right? So again, I'm going to connect this line here. And let's suppose that my T is, you know, like yay big. Okay, so not very scientific, but basically in this case I can see that hey, you know, neither of these points in in between B and C are particularly bad, right? They are a pretty good polygonal fit. So let's see what happens when I don't violate the constraint. Because here I say okay, this is my worst case scenario, but it's not really that bad. Okay, so let me see what the next step of this algorithm is. The next step is saying you know, otherwise. Remove the last vertex from in process and um, make it the last vertex of final. Okay, so that means I'm going to take. This guy, say, okay, C, you guys are good. I'm going to move you over to final, okay? Now, what do I do next? Um, well, I'm going to start again, but let me just say that if my in process is not empty, go to step one. If it is empty, 
I'm done. And the vertices in my final list are the ordered vertices of a polygon. Okay, so let's see what I would do here. So now I'd say, okay, now I'm going to connect from A to C. Again, I'm pretty happy that neither of these guys is particularly bad, right? So now I'm going to say, okay, that means I move this guy over to here. Now I have to connect from B to A, okay? That's the same line, but now I'm going the other way, right? So now I have to look at my worst offenders in this direction, and I would come up and say, hey, you guy are pretty bad, right? D is pretty bad. So now I have to add this new vertex over to D. Now I have to connect D to A, and I say, okay, you are okay. So I think I can successfully take D over here. And then I connect B to D. Like I say, you, you are okay too. Then I move B to here. And now I've got this ordered vertex list, B, C, A, D, B, that gives me a pretty good polygon fit, right? So that's pretty easy. And, you know, that's a very simple way of fitting a polygon to a set of points. And obviously, if I wanted a, you know, more strict fitting polygon, then I would turn my threshold T down. And in fact, if I turn that T down to like, you know, 0 0.001, then I would just end up basically connecting the dots into a more jerky polygon, right? Um, now, obviously, those of you that know like computer graphics and so on will probably also know other methods for connecting lines into smooth curves, right? So for example, you've probably heard of like uh, cubic B splines, right? So those of you that are computer graphics people have probably fit splines through families of points, and that's a possibility too. So I mean, there are ways of, for example, fitting a nice, you know, spliny boundary around here. And those are a little bit more complicated, and I don't want to talk about them right now, but they're also kind of straightforward extensions, right? You know, you can argue about whether it's easier to represent things with polygons or splines, right? So in the early days of video games, all of the objects were kind of polygonal flat faces, and these days, lots of surfaces are more like spliny surfaces, right? So um, a lot depends on what you're, what you're doing it for. Okay, so questions or comments about that? I'm not gonna ask you to actually implement that in MATLAB, because I think that would be a little bit of a, of a pain. Question? I have a question about the earlier algorithm. Yes. So what happens if you've got like almost a Right, so yeah, what happens when you've got an outline that is beautiful, but one point is missing like a gap, okay? So that's a good question. So I could have certainly something like, uh, you know, suppose that I had, like this was my set of edge points. Right, so how do, you know, so in this case, when I would follow this boundary around, I would, um, so actually, the, the algorithm I told you about is really looking at closed curves, right? So for one thing, the algorithm would probably like go around the exterior of the curve and then kind of go around the interior of the curve and come back, right? So you kind of get this double list. What I really want to do is I want to bridge this gap, right? And that's actually going to be the topic of something we're going to talk about next week, which is called morphological image processing, right? So when I've got these binary images, it's very common that there are either gaps like this or there are um, extra blobs that I want to get rid of. And so it's definitely possible that I want to do some pre-processing on my edge image before I start to do this higher level reasoning. So I want to connect up that gap before I apply the algorithm. So we'll talk about that gap filling next week for sure. Good question. Yeah? Would a different solution be say going around your eight neighbors and also go around the next set of neighbors? Well, then you get a little bit tricky. So the question is, would you want to look at your, you know, like five by five set of neighbors, right? and potentially jump over the gap. Honestly, I don't know that that's very common, right? So typically, you only want to deal with pixels that are really connected to you, right? Because then you run the risk of, you know, suppose I had some other crap pixel over here that wasn't connected at all, then I would jump over there, and then everything would go to hell, right? So, um, yeah, so usually you don't want to make too many inferences about what might be happening too far away. Um, yeah. Other questions or comments? 
Okay, so the last part of the lecture I want to talk about um, a very particular um, problem, which is fitting straight lines in images. Okay. So, you know, when you've just got one straight line in an image, right? So suppose that I had, you know, um, you know, suppose I had just like beautiful straight line. Maybe it wasn't exactly, well, no, let's, I guess I should have, you know. S suppose I've got like this straight line here and I could apply my algorithm and life is good, right? But, you know, what if I had other straight lines in the image? Like, how would I kind of simultaneously find all these lines at once, right? That's what I want to talk about next, is because obviously in lots of man-made images, you've got lots of lines, right? It's not like there's just this one beautiful line in your image. You've got four lines around every doorway, and you've got four lines around every window. And so how do you find those kinds of lines in the image? So um, let's just say this is easy to do with the previous algorithm. when there's only one line. So what about multiple lines? And not only that, and uh, what I would say is clutter, meaning many edge pixels not on any line. So in some sense, what I want to do is I want to separate the liney stuff from the non-liney stuff. Okay? And that's definitely very common in um, real world images. So, or what I got here. So let's suppose that I look at um, Right, so here is a here's an image. There are definitely some very strong straight lines in it, right? And this is actually, by the way, this is a real image that I took of a space that was lit that you might think it was like a computer graphics rendering. It was very kind of cool to imagine that there were all these kind of very smooth shapes. And so if I were to look at the edges of this image um, without any you know particular care about the parameters, you know, I'm gonna get, yes, lots of pixels along the edges, and again, this is just a rendering problem. If I were to zoom in on, you know, here, you can see the edges are, you know, pretty many pixels on these strong edges. So I have a pretty good chance of trying to connect those into lines, but there's all this other distracting stuff that don't belong on any line, right? And so I don't want to get myself distracted by all this other possible crap, right? And so how do I choose which edges lie on lines and which ones don't? So, I'll tell you. So it's a pretty clever idea. It's called the Huff Transform. So the idea is, is as follows, right? So let's suppose I have an image, and I consider one edge pixel in this image, OK? Now, Let's think about all the lines that possibly might go through that pixel, right? There's this line, there's this line, there's this line, right? There's basically a line for every degree going around the circle, right? So each of these lines, so each possible line through an edge pixel, can be represented as an equation. Right? So when you were in, uh, you know, I don't know what, seventh grade, you learned about representing lines like mx plus b, where m was the slope and b was the intercept, right? So that's all, that's true, although we run into problems like when 
you know, when I've got a straight up and down line, then the slope is in theory infinite, right? So I don't want that. Um, a better behaved way of representing the lines is as follows. X cosine theta plus Y sine theta equals rho. So in this case, theta is like the angle of the line. So let me draw a little picture here. So again, if this is my uh, kind of image space where x is increasing this way, y is increasing that way. So here, if this is some line, theta is like this angle. So it tells me the orientation of the line. And rho is like this distance. And so that means that theta equals 0 is going to be a horizontal line. right? That means that theta is equal to 0. I have a line like this. And then theta equals 0, I plug that in, is just basically saying that uh, x times cosine 0 is 1 is a constant, right? And y is not even in the equation. And conversely, if I have theta equals pi over 2, then I have a vertical line. And you know, rho tells me basically how far away is that line from the center of the image. So if rho is equal to 0, this line is going through the middle of the image. If rho is not equal to 0, the line is further and further away, right? So instead of using m and b to represent a line, I can use theta and rho. And the nice thing is that in this case, I don't have any problems with, for example, uh, theta is always between you know minus pi and pi, and rho is between you know zero and you know whatever the biggest pixel in the image is, right? So I don't have any sort of numerical problems with this. Okay. And so the idea is that you know in the beginning, let's say that for this edge pixel, I have no idea what other points on it may belong to uh, a line, right? So what I can do is I can make a list of possible theta and rho for every possible line going through that pixel, right? So a single point in the xy plane here, an edge point, generates a whole bunch of possibilities, theta rho pairs, for lines, right? So a single edge point, x comma y, uh, could belong to many possible lines in the kind of rho comma theta world, right? So what I have is kind of a map that says, OK, between theta going from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, I guess I'm going to say this. And then I have basically minimum values for what rho could be. So this single point here, if I enumerate all the possible corresponding lines, is going to trace out, as it turns out, a curve. It actually looks like a piece of a cosine. Okay. So this here are basically you know, possible lines corresponding to some point x1, y1, let's say. OK. And now, let's look at some other edge point. OK. So now let's suppose that I say, OK, well, here, this was x1, comma y1. Let's suppose I look at this guy here, x2, comma y2. Again, this guy has an infinite number of lines going through it, including one of the ones that happens to go through x1, y1. Right? So if I take the curve corresponding to x2, y2, I'm going to get some different curve. And there's going to be a place where those two curves cross over. And that corresponds to the line connecting those two points. Okay? And so the idea of the Huff transform is that for every edge point, I generate kind of a quantized version of this space. Right? So what I do is I take the theta comma rho space. I block it up into a whole bunch of tiny pixels. And for every edge point, I uh, basically increment the pixels along this curve by one unit. right? And as I see more edge points, I keep on incrementing those bins. And for places where lots of edge points are voting for the same line, this guy is going to have a lot of you know, people saying, hey, I'm on that line. I could be on that line. right? And that's the way I learn which lines there are in the image. right? So it's a pretty clever idea. And so this is kind of like what you'd call like a voting kind of algorithm. And so let me spell that for you a little more explicitly. So the basic idea 
is first I detect edge points. Okay, so now I have a binary image. Then I decide on a kind of a subdivision of this rho theta plane. And then for each edge point, I increment the corresponding rho theta cells in this array by plus one. So I do this for all my edge points, right? So now I've populated this big array, okay? And now I look at it and I say, I uh, look for rho theta cells with large pixel counts. Another way of saying this is I'm gonna look for peaks in this array, right? I'm gonna find the places where there are lots of people contributing, right? And now I'm going to basically, you know, select the highest peaks. And again, that's kind of a user choice about how many of these peaks I wanna keep. And then I can kind of map the corresponding rho theta into, uh, into lines in the xy plane, right? So every, you know, every rho theta corresponds to some line in the plane. And if I wanted to, I could even go further and say, look for the edge points that voted for that guy. And that way, instead of getting full lines, I could even get like line segments that are actually, you know, um, basically, or get line segments that correspond to votes. OK, so let's look at some examples of this, right? So this is, this is a nice real world thing. And so um, MATLAB provides a few functions that help you out with this. Um, so the key one is called Huff, Huff rhyming with tough. So basically here, this says, take a black and white image. Uh, so basically it says, take a black and white image that comes out of like an edge detector. And what it returns is the theta and the row. Uh, so theta and row basically tells you where did I, how much did I quantize each of those things. And H is this array that tells me uh, what are the increments in each of the bits, right? And so Huff by itself doesn't necessarily do it all for you, right? So if I look at this, there's a thing that says Huff peaks, which says identify peaks in the Huff transform. So I can basically specify I want the 10 highest peaks in this Huff array. And then there's a function called Huff lines that basically says if I give you the edge image and I tell you the row theta array and I tell you the peaks, tell me where those lines are in the xy plane. So you could argue that you could have incorporated this all into one function. I did, and I called it my huff. My huff. Check it out. So here it is. So basically, this kind of puts it all together. It says, give me an image, find me the edges. So that's what this BW is. And then take the huff transform and show me the Huff transform in a graph. And then I have an argument that says either find me you know, up to 50 peaks according to a threshold that I specify, right? So I'm kind of saying how high do I want those peaks to be? And then put those peaks back on the image. And so I don't use, I guess I didn't use Huff lines. I wrote my own thing to do that because I think that the output of Huff lines can sometimes be a little bit confusing. So. Let's see some stuff. So let's read in some images that have strong lines. Right? 
so kind of a typical thing, right, is a Sudoku grid, right? So there are lots of lines in this image, but there are also, like, every basically letter in this image is going to also respond as an edge pixel, right? So there's also going to be some clutter. And so if I apply my huff to this image, I'm going to get a bunch of stuff, right? So here is the edge pixel map. And you can see that, yes, I pick up all of the um, line pixels, but also around every number and letter, I have edge pixels too, right? So those are going to act as clutter. Then here is the picture of the Huff array, right? So here, the x-axis is the angle, and the y-axis is the kind of distance the line is away from the origin, right? So here what you see is that every one of these light blue curves corresponds to one edge pixel. And then when I have lots of curves that happen to occur in the same place, you get these high value bins, right? So here you can see that these yellow and red you know, bins are ones where lots of pixels have accumulated, right? Those correspond to these strong edges, right? And so here, this white squares is the Huff Peaks algorithm picking out the places where those guys are maximum. And then when I map those guys back onto the image, I get these lines, right? So this is like the best case scenario. And one of the reasons is that there's nothing else in this image that is like distracting me from finding these lines, right? If I were to turn down the threshold, right? So part of the issue is how high do the peaks have to be? Because certainly there are going to be some coincidental lines, right? So you could imagine that, you know, if I were to look at the edges that corresponded to the middle row of this text, right? There are going to be about, you know, 40 or 50 edge pixels that are going to coincidentally lie on a straight line, right? So you have to kind of say, okay, well, what is my threshold for how many points are going to be allowed to be contributing to a line? Right? Clearly, I have to have, you know, 50 or 100 or whatever it is for my given scenario. Otherwise, I'm going to get a lot of line clutter, right? A lot of coincidental lines. And so, again, this is like the image processing textbook, you know, example. Let's look at some more realistic images and see what we can do. So, um, I have one called Shell. I guess we showed you the Shells one before. So let's see how we do on that guy there. So just as a reminder, here is my shelf image. And what do I get if I just were to apply my Huff transform with the default parameters? OK. So I got a bunch of lines, right? And actually, all these lines are correct because you can see that um, you know, they correspond to different edges of different parts of the shells. And if I look in the Huff array, so in this case, you know, there are, you know, there aren't parallel lines as there were in the Sudoku example. And so here I have different values of theta where the peaks are. And, you know, there are also going to be, obviously there are some lines that I missed, right? So if I, if I think about it, maybe what I would want to do is I would want to turn down my threshold for the peaks to try and pick up the lines that I missed. And so what I did in my example was to provide as an extra argument an optional threshold that basically says, um, okay, you know, find me things that are, I think, I, I think this in my function is defined as the fraction of the highest peak. So find me things that are from the highest peak to 40% of the highest peak. Uh-oh. Why you no show? Uh-oh. Everything went wrong. Did I think about my syntax the wrong way? So here, yeah, this should be a fraction. Oh, arg. I guess I, I, guess I have to uh, provide a thing like this. Uh, OK. So here, if I kind of turn down the threshold, I picked up some more peaks than I had before. And I also picked up some more edges, right? So now I've got um, the top and bottom of many of the shelves. And you know, so far, I don't have any extra edges, right? So maybe I can be a little bit more generous still. 
and see if I can pick up some more. Whoa, so now things are starting to get a little bit crazy, right? So here you'd have to be a little bit careful to actually think about uh, where, whether there are some spurious edges. So, so certainly, like now I have these diagonal edges, right? Like, it's hard to say, but like this one where my mouse is, right? There's definitely no edge in the image that corresponds to that, right? And that's starting to be edge pixels that are coincidentally lining up to provide just enough evidence for that line, right? Or this vertical edge here obviously doesn't correspond to a real edge in the image. So you've got to be careful, right? So I think that, you know, again, you don't want to accept every line that comes out of this as being uh, a valid line. And so there's definitely a lot of post-processing you could do on these lines. So for example, one thing that you could do is you could say, okay, now I'm going to look at all of the edge pixels that voted for each line, and if the edge pixels are not connected together or close together, I am going to throw that line out, right? So it could be that maybe this vertical line was created by coincidental edge pixels that are scattered along each of the shelves, and I say, well, there's no evidence that there's actually a contiguous set of edge pixels voting for the line. So you could, have, you could do definitely some post-processing on this stuff. Let me go back to what my default parameters gave me just to show, um, you know, one thing that would be very useful for this, and this is actually something that happens in image processing and computer vision, is that here there is definitely going to be something that now I can start to reason about the geometry of the camera and the image. So for example, I could get uh, vanishing lines where all of these you know, all of these points, all these lines here are eventually going to intersect at a point over here. All these other lines are going to intersect at a point over here. It turns out that those vanishing lines help me learn things about the 3D geometry of the image. So I could use this for maybe some sort of like navigation. You can imagine if I turned this around and I was looking at buildings in Manhattan, I could get vanishing lines that would give me some sense of where my camera was in the space. And that's embedded in some things that are like in Google Maps and so on, for example. Again, this is still a pretty good image in terms of being nice to work with. So uh, last time I showed you this corner image. So let's see where, how we do with that. So here, again, lots of nice straight lines, but also lots of other stuff, right? So I'm not sure what to expect here. I mean, I guess I'm kind of sure because I did this at home, but I can show you. So. Um, what do we got now? Huh. Well, some good news and some bad news, right? I mean, so again, there are some lines here that I trust, right? Like I trust this big guy here, and I trust this guy here because it's going through this kind of part of the building. But there are lots of spurious lines, right? And so again, it's not like this is some sort of an exact science. And it, part of it is that you, know, you could ask, why didn't I pick up, you know, like this? long line along this building. And part of it is that there just didn't turn out to be the canny edge detector did not find a lot of or a sufficient number of pixels that were right along that one line. And the other thing is that this is really looking for literally straight lines, right? So for some reason there's like some sort of camera distortion and those pixels don't actually lie on a really, really straight line. Well, then the Huff transform is not going to find it, right? It has to really be truly uh, a real straight line. And again, there are lots of straight lines in the image. Look at all these nice lines here. The problem is that if I were to turn down my threshold to try and pick up these very short lines, I would end up picking up, like, look at all these pixels here that are from this uh, kind of, I don't even know what that is in the image. It's just like stucco texture on the wall that the edge detector is picking up, right? And so if I was to try and find the edges of this shutter, I would probably also be picking up like all sorts of crazy other Huff lines, right? And so the answer might be, well, maybe I should first do some more stringent uh, edge detection to try and find just objects of interest that I care about, and then I could do like Huff transform inside a subregion of the image. That would be fine, right? I have to do it on the whole thing. So again, I could try and do better. I could try to, again, reduce the threshold um, and, you know, or actually, in this case, what I'm going to try to do is, in here, if I increase the threshold, that's like saying you really have to be a good line to pass my test, right? So here, this is a much, you know, these, these lines are accurate, but I don't get that many of them, right? So I could basically continue to try to fool around with this. So here, this is like saying this is going to give me a bazillion lines, right? Um, and I'm just taking the top 50 of them. But again, here I do get a bunch of true lines, right? All the ones that are kind of like, up and down, and these ones here that kind of go off to a vanishing point. 
So, so for example, here I got some lines that corresponded to the top edges of these windows, right? Gave me that line. So again, you could also filter on the thing, right? You could say, okay, I'm expecting some lines at this orientation. Just find me the strongest vertical lines, right? Find me the 50 strongest vertical lines. You could do that. I think I had one more example. Um, so here, again, an image that has lots of different kinds of lines. There's lines in the ceiling tile, there's lines in the piping, there's lines in this architectural ceiling. And so, you know, let's see what we get. Well, I certainly got a lot of crap uh, up here, and those probably came from just spurious lines. I did get these lines up here in the kind of heating duct area, and I got some parallel lines corresponding to parts of the ceiling tile. Uh, and I got a couple of these strong lines up here in the ceiling, like there's a very strong diagonal line up here. And I can kind of say, okay, well, let me turn down my, let, let me make this a little more stringent and uh, find me really only the strong lines. So if I do that, you know, here are some strong lines. And I think that except for this diagonal one, I think we could all agree these are pretty good lines. I'm not sure what's up with, with this line. Um, but the other ones I think are reasonable. Again, this is a pretty complicated image. So, I mean, it would be tough to try to reason about the geometry of this scene. If I turn this down a little bit. Even turning it down just a tiny, about, tiny bit gives me st starting at lots of crazy lines. And part of that is that this ceiling is very textured and this piping area is very edgy. And so, you know, there's definitely going to be some spurious lines caused by the coincidental intersection of all these edges, right? So anyway, so the homework asks you to play around with the Huff transform on some images. So question. Can we do better by low pass filter in a minute before doing that? Yeah, that's a good question. So could we do better by low pass filtering the image? And maybe an example of that would be, um, well, we could try it, I guess. Uh, I wonder whether or not the rad key of the past included an edge option in here. So let's try using a LOG detector instead. So I don't remember how do you, so I definitely can use an LOG detector and I have to pass in a threshold and a sigma. So let's try it on that corner image. So now I'm going off script, so I'm not sure how well this is going to work. Um, so let's try looking at the edges of this image with the LOG and, uh, well, let's just see what we get first. Okay, so clearly I have lots of, lots of edges here with the default thing. So I need to use an LOG that was maybe a little bit So this is telling me that this LOG threshold is this high, and I want to specify, I think, a higher threshold and a higher sigma to make this work. So threshold, let's say I want to have, uh, number one, stronger images, stronger image edges. So maybe like, let's see what we get with this. Okay, so here, here this is a little bit better in the sense that I'm only looking for really strong edges. And I'm wondering whether if I were to turn up the sigma, so what is the default sigma here? Default sigma is two pixels. So let's see if I can turn this up to maybe, how do I do this without, uh, This is one of the things where I'm not sure how I can tune the sigma and the thing at the same time. So let's try a sigma that's quite a bit bigger than before. So here I have no images. All right, let's not overthink this. So let's just make a blurrier version of that corner image. That's a good idea. So 
Um, let's make a filtered version of this image with a Gaussian. Or actually, let's just make a low pass filter because we're all in the mood to go home. So let's make a blurry image. And then see how that looks. Actually, it's not as blurry as I'd like, so let's make it a little bit, a little bit bigger. So, okay. So now this blurs out some texture. In fact, we could really go even further than this and see what we get. Okay. So let's see what would happen here. I guess actually, though, I'm I'm starting to run up against the problem of ringing, right? So I don't want to blur this with a box filter too much because I may get some sort of strange thing. So what I want to do, actually, no, I'm sorry, not ringing. It's, uh, well, okay, let's, let's see what we get if we do the canny, no, the huff on this. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, that didn't work well at all, actually. Let's just see, though, Detected edge pixels. I think what's finding it's the finding the edges of this. So one thing is, let me turn this into a uint8, and the other thing is, let me be a little bit more generous with my threshold. Yeah. Okay. So here's kind of an example showing that if I were to blur things out to only ask for the edges that were at a very strong scale, then I could expect to find um, you know, these dark edges along the boundaries. I'm not sure why I didn't pick this one up, but I guess it's because the distinction between this edge and the background is not as strong. But yeah, I mean, this actually worked OK. Um, if I were to be a little bit more conservative even, maybe I would pick up more. Here I'm starting to make it. I took it a little bit too far. I went too far. And again, if I was a little bit more intelligent about having used the right balance for the LOG detector, for example, I probably could do a pretty good job of asking for huff edges at a certain scale. Right? That would kind of combine what we talked about last time, what we combined about this time. Right? So yeah, that's a good point. So if I don't want to find huff edges in clutter, then I should get rid of the clutter first. right? Okay, and so next time we're going to talk about some of the stuff that we touched on today, which were, you know, things are not perfect, right? So one thing is, how can we clean up this edge image or clean up a binary image in general before we start to do processing on it? Those are called morphological operations. And I've alluded to thresholding an image a few times. We're going to talk about thresholding in the context of how that might help you, for example, find objects. Okay, so that's it. And I will see you. Question. <laughs>